Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. Hi, I'm Susan, and I'm a college counselor and have read applications for a small liberal arts college and two research universities. My twins are recent college graduates. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, alarmed by AI chatbots, universities start revamping how they teach. This is a New York Times article by Kelly Huang. She interviewed over 30 presidents, students, and and professors and educators about chat GPT. And Susan is my co-pilot. There'll be two speak pipe questions that Lisa and I will tackle. One's from Nina in Massachusetts, and she wants to know, How colleges handle siblings who apply in the same year? And Amanda from Texas is our second one, and she wants to know, why do colleges put so much emphasis on finding leaders? It doesn't feel diverse. What about other talents and gifts? And our final part is my interview with Dr. Kelly Holloway, the VP of Enrollment, Director of Admissions at Mercer. And the topic is Understanding Mercer. And I call Spotlight, Linda Depker is back to join me again as we discuss Pomona College in Claremont, California. Susan, what's new in Pennsylvania? Hey, Mark. Well, we had a little bit of snow this morning. Here it is, you know, pushing to the end of January, and we've had like, hardly had a flurry, but uh, had a bit of a blizzard, lasted about five minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I don't miss those days, but uh, five I'm minutes sure I can handle. <laughs> Well, after all my years living in, in Maine, uh, you know, 30 inches of fresh snow was, was kind of a treat as long as I didn't have to do any of the shoveling. Uh, so this go. is nice. You get to enjoy the, the prettiness of it, and then it goes away. No, if I'm outside looking at it and it's coming down and I'm warm, I'm good. It's just when I have to, like, go shovel and drive and slip in ice. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So, friends, I, I, I reached out to Susan just 20 minutes before. I was like, Susan, do you have a tip for us today? And she fired one back on text that I was like, bingo, I would love for you to share that tip. So take it away, Susan. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting um, th- this winter reading applications I, as I do f- as an adjunct for a um, a fairly selective university that is both liberal arts and has professional schools of of engineering and business. And it, it's a it's a university like so many where the student filling out the common application on the supplement has to identify the two academic interests, first choice and second choice. They can be undecided arts and sciences. They could be undecided engineering. They don't have to pick a specialty, but many of them do. So for the students who are are other than undecided arts and sciences, if they're putting a professional field of study down, then the it, the application readers are going to look for um, wherewithal. What is the student's uh, rationale? What is their experience for engineering or business or education? Um, and other schools, other universities that have nursing and uh, physical therapy, and these are areas where relevant experience is waived. So how does the college find that out? Well, first of all, of course, they look at the why this major supplementary question that the co- the mm-hmm. colleges have. You know, what is it about this this major that attracts you and how have you been prepared for it or something of the like. But then they also look at the activities section of the application to see when how you've chosen to spend your time. Have you naturally been drawn, you know, whether it's it's to um, you know, building computers in your basement or taking, um, you know, uh, you know, MIT or Coursera courses outside the curriculum. Some kids are lucky and they get to take coursework 
relative to engineering and business in their high schools, and some aren't. They're not going to be penalized if it's not available. But given what's available to students now, there's so many ways to reach out. And even as a, a teenager, educate yourself about uh, what a field of study entails, uh, what people who are leaders in the field do. Um, because let me tell you, there's a big difference when I read, for example, a biomedical engineering applicant and the student thinks it's pre-med they, they, versus a biomedical engineering student who's been doing robotics, has been working with 3D printers on prosthetic devices. You know, some kids are lucky and they have those experiences, but they can at least study it and know what they're talking about. Um, so, so I have a I, question for you on this, Susan. So, so when you see no reinforcement, somebody lists it, engineering, and you don't see anything in the activities, and it's not mentioned by any counselor rec or anything, not seen in summers, anything, it is, is the concern that they, they don't know what they're getting into and who, like, and, and therefore, like, you know, it could be an attrition risk, it could be a mismatch. Um, do you think that's the biggest, like, what is it specifically that triggers, this isn't good. Is it that, is that, is that the biggest fear? Like they could get here and think, oh, this is completely not for me. And next thing you know, I'm either trying to find a new school or jump around, or is it another concern besides that? For, for me, it's really, they're not competitive. You know, sure. sometimes you read an yeah. application, Mark, and you mm -hmm. see raw talent. And I used to right. see this, this at my school, at my high sure. school. sure where maybe a kid had, um, you know, had some business exposure. Maybe they mm -hmm. they they worked in the summer and maybe they started a little entrepreneurial lawn mowing mm -hmm. business in their neighborhood. Or I could spot mm -hmm. the kids based on their activities whose brains were kind of percolating with the idea mm -hmm. of uh, small business administration. Per and maybe then they yeah. were lucky to get into an internship or something, but mm -hmm. even if they weren't able to do that, they're, they're, I've read applications this year from students who've chosen to educate themselves about things, mm -hmm. take online courses, use YouTube to mm -hmm. um, fix car engines. <laughs> uh, YouTube University, that's what we call it. <laughs> it is absolutely unbelievable. I read a great essay um, a while back about a student who started on lawnmowers. Um, his dad, his mom or his dad were away, and and his job was to keep the lawn mowed, and it, he had to figure it out, and he um, got some advice. You know, I remember a, a funny moment. It's I, I read so many essays, but this was a funny moment where he said, "I wish there had been a AAA roadside service for lawn mower repairs, <laughs> and I could have called called an expert <laughs> and had that <laughs> in, and I could have learned and watched." But he said, "I had you know I had to do do it on myself, my own." And um, you know, the kids who during the pandemic uh, started doing nice things for their neighbors. I read I read an application from a a gal who. Um, the she wants to be a, study entrepreneurship, and during the pandemic, she started just doing nice things for her neighbors, baking mostly around baking. And before too long, neighbors were saying, "Could I order from you?" Mm -hmm. You know, because this was this is really fabulous. And you know, she parlayed that into a substantial small business, um, and it gave her, you know, through research and reading, a taste for. Uh, you know, what it might like to be to study that in college. And, you know, the other thing is it can look inauthentic too. Yes. So, you know, an example and is um, I actually had breakfast with a college counselor who, um, this is back with Rick Singer at, you know, the, one of the schools reached out to the, the school. This was what's Rick Singer client at this, this private school, this counselor worked at. And they reached out to the school counselor because they were seeing very high level water polo and they weren't seeing it anywhere else in the file from anybody, no comments from anybody about how extraordinary this person was or anything. Quite the story. So they got the call and they basically said, this student has not done these things. And then um, Singer got some high powered attorney that went to the headmaster and threatened to sue them and destroy them. And then the counselor was told to just 
lay low and chill and not bring it up. That's an interesting, that's an interesting story. But anyway, that, that's, an, that's another thing, though. It can look yeah. inauthentic, too, if you have something. Now, you're coming more from the essay, Sim, or no, no, from the picking selection of major, not reinforced. It can also be the other thing. If you're extra, it's describing an activity that looks like you've had substantial impact and it just doesn't radiate and there's no other mentions of it anywhere. And I think sometimes people, they get in their own tunnel, they're in yeah. activities, they're thinking only activities, or they're in essays and they're not thinking essays, or they think testing and think only testing. And I always have to say to people, like, this is one piece of the puzzle. The admission officer is going to see the whole tapestry. That's right. And, and how it all fits together. And so and, I really think this is a great tip that you brought up. That's a brilliant observation because the the applications that are the most compelling are those without a doubt have pieces fitting together that allow the reader of the application to see a a coherent picture. And a piece of every high school student's application is the not knowing. It's the wondering what the future holds. Mm -hmm. It's the not having all the answers. It's the big questions in a young person's mind about who they are and how they're going to use their talents, skills, and interests to pave a way for the future. And that's, a lot of kids leave that piece out because they're afraid it will make them look weaker, but it, it mm -hmm. actually can serve to tie together the, the other pieces of the application uh, in, a, in a very coherent and authentic way. You know, colleges don't want to admit kids that are perfect that are, first of all, they know it's impossible, but that they're not yeah. finished products. The college, the college wants to write the next chapter, you know, mm -hmm. in, that, well in that young person's life. Thank you. This was great. I'm really glad we talked about that because that that's what builds trust. You know, that's what builds trust when you figure out. I, I feel like I understand who this person is, you know, authentically and what they'll be bringing to our community. So that's, and then of course the opposite, you know, creates the opposite effect. All right, so our, our admissions vernacular is three initials, COA, and you may see that plastered around, particularly when it comes to finance, and it stands for cost of attendance. And it's the number I always want people to think about when they think about the cost of college. It is not, it is everything. It's the combination of your billable and your non-billable expenses, sometimes called direct and indirect what do I mean by that? Well, your direct or billable is what you pay the bursar's office. So if you're in on if you're staying on campus, then it's going to be tuition, you know, uh, lodging and meals or room and board and student fees. You know, it's going to be those things. But it's not only that. Cost of attendance takes those other factors. What are those other factors? Transportation, books, supplies, and personal miscellaneous expenses, spending money. And all of that is your true cost of college. And so that's how it should be listed when you're looking at an aid award. And that's how I want families to think through. And one thing I'll say, Big Future has some, in some other places, you have some really good calculators. Where you can yep. go on to compare cost to cost. And it has a line item for everything in case you forget one of these things. Or if an aid award, which so oftentimes happen, is excluding something, then you have that line item there and say, hey, what, what about student fees? You know, what, what about health insurance? Is that covered? Is it mandatory? You know, and then I like people actually to go through for their, obviously the non-billable is going to be very personal. If someone's eating ramen noodles and someone else is going to Ruth Chris, there's going to be a different uh, food bill there on the on the off-campus meals or ordering, you know, sushi every night delivered back through, through Uber Eats. <laughs> so um, I like people individually to go through and figure out what's my lifestyle? What's that going to cost me? Transportation. How often are you coming home? Are you coming home five times a year? Is that five airfares? Are we coming for parents weekend? Or are we flying at the end of the year? Um, is your brother coming? You know, is bo are both parents going? That could be 10, 11 flights. Right. What about hotels? What do they cost in the year? Like, so really doing that assessment, that's how you really get at your true cost. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, admissions vernacular, COA. And I have not done a grinding my gears in a while. So I have one. Good. <laughs> Back by popular demand. It's, uh, you know, I don't hesitate to name names on this, Susan. That's so right. This school, doesn't mean this is not a great school at all. Please don't take it that way. But something I didn't like that they did. 
a school that has the name of one of your children, so you know what that Uh-oh. would be. Uh-oh. Hamilton. That's so I'm right. working with a student for Hamilton on an essay. And this year, you know, Hamilton's one of these schools that says we have no college-specific essays, just the personal statement. And they get you to go ahead and complete and pay your money and submit. Then when you go into the portal, there's an option, optional, not so optional. Why Hamilton's sitting there waiting for you? And that's a little slick to me because schools know that the more they ask for, they can decrease their number of applicants. There's always going to be someone that says, I'm not writing another one of them. So they want the best of both worlds. They want the as many applications as you can make it easy, but then at the same time, we want this valuable information partly to discern fit, to 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 help with demonstrated interest and demonstrated understanding. Uh, I get that, but to me, it's a little bit of lack of truth of advertising because we know they really do want you to do that essay, and it's and it's actually clearly implied in that they want you to do it. So I think if they really want you to do it, I really think they need to put it up front and let people know. So that's what's grinding my gears. It's work for the student that the college really wanted you to do, but they wanted to, you know, get the benefit of saying we have no upfront stuff. There's no way people don't know that's happening. Like they're blindsided. They they think I'm done. I paid. I hit submit. You know how they word optional. That's not really optional stuff, Susan. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know. That to me is not, it grinds my gears. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, in the name of transparency, which is going to be uh, the the big theme song moving forward. Um, James Murphy's, you know, the the last recommendation that he made in his series of of articles is a call for transparency. I think this, you know, the Supreme Court's going to be talking a lot about that. And, you know, if, if a college is moving some of its short questions and written responses to the portal, it should say that say so on the college's website. You know, it, it should say, here's what you'll be doing in the application. Um, here's what you'll submit. And then here's what, you know, if the, if the interview isn't requested until the student is applied and gets the portal, like at Tufts, for example, and, and other places, it should say that, you know, um, and more schools are moving things like the interview requests, not all of them. There's still a lot that work off a calendar on the website, but any written work absolutely should be itemized on the college's website. But I have found, Mark, and I'm sure you would agree, that kids aren't reading the individual college's admissions websites. They're just working off the common app. Because, you know, colleges tend to give a really thoughtful, um, helpful mission-driven statement about their admissions process on their website, on the admissions website. And yeah, and that's really glad. I'm really glad you said that, Susan, because that's the second tip today. Like, don't just rely on the Common App. Check the admission web section of the website as well. That's excellent. It, we should have saved that for another week. <laughs> I know, but you know, but between both of us, we'll have enough tips. We'll come back with something. We'll come we can back do it one it. week. Yeah. All right. Our big number is ten billion dollars. And what is this? Well, in late January, Microsoft said we are investing ten billion in OpenAI. Who is OpenAI? They are the creator of Chat GPT. The tech giant San Francisco aiming to remain at the forefront of generative artificial intelligence. And with that, that's a perfect segue into our article, Susan. See how I did that? A little slick. Beautiful. Beautiful. (laughs) And now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. All right, so our article today is in the New York Times, and it is um, entitled, Alarmed by AI Chatbots, Universities Start Revamping How They Teach. And you know this article hit a spot in the, in, in the, in the population out there because, I, you know, New York Times is huge, and it oftentimes will generate a 1,000 comments uh, within 24, 48 hours, but this one generated over 3,000 comments, like within the first 24 hours. Wow. And the article, yeah, 3,200, 3, and it's by 
Kelly Kang, and she covers youth and technology uh, from San Francisco. And what she did in this article is that she interviewed more than 30 professors, students, and university administrators. And she learned a lot. So um, she starts out by talking about a professor at Northern Michigan named Anthony Amon, and he's a professor of philosophy. And he talks about how he got a paper that he said was easily the best paper that he had seen from anybody in the class. In fact, it was so good that a red flag went up. And what Amin did was he confronted the student over whether that student had written it, written it himself, the essay. And give the student credit, the student confessed that he'd used ChatGPT, a chat box that delivers ex information, it explains concepts, and it generates ideas in very simple sentences. In this case, ChatGPT had written the paper. So Amin was like, wow, we have a problem here. And he's got to be an amazing teacher because what he decided to do was transform the essay writing for the course for the entire semester. And so he said he's going to require students to first write their first draft in the classroom. He would use browsers that monitor and restrict computer activity. And then in later drafts, students were gonna have to explain each of their revisions. He also is considering foregoing using essays in subsequent semesters. And he plans on weaving chat GPT into his lessons by asking students to evaluate GPT's responses. So give him an A for creativity and critical thinking. Boy. And then the article goes, goes on to say across the country, professors like Amin, department chairs, administrators, they're starting to overhaul their classrooms in response to chat GPT. And it's leading to this huge shift in teaching and learning. And so some other teachers are doing things like making changes to include oral exams, adding more group work, and adding handwritten assessments instead of typed ones. The article goes on to say that the moves are part of a real-time grappling with the new technological wave known as generative artificial intelligence. And ChatGPT just came out in November. So this is hot off the press. This is Absolutely. new stuff. Yeah. And uh, it's basically done, as I said, by the artificial intelligence lab, OpenAI. Um, and what the chatbot does is it generates eerily articulate and nuanced text in response to very sharp prompts. Like Linda and I were having a Zoom session the other day, and she's like, "Have you have you actually done this? Have you done it?" So she she said, "Share screen." We're on Zoom, and then she I can't remember what prompt she threw out, but she threw out a prompt, and then and bang, it just popped all up on screen. So I I got to see it firsthand, uh, and students and people are been using it right now to write love letters, poetry, fiction, and of course schoolwork. Uh, some public school systems, including New York City and Seattle, have banned the tool on their Wi-Fi networks and created other devices to prevent cheating, although they say students have still found workarounds. And in higher ed, colleges and universities have been reluctant to ban AI um, because administrators doubt that the move is going to be effective anyway. And they also worry that it's going to be an infringement on academic freedom. So one such person, Joe Glover, the provost at the University of Florida, he says, this isn't going to be the last innovation we have to deal with. So we may as well deal with it. Um, the article goes on to say that um, the San Francisco company is one of the world's amb most ambitious artificial intelligence labs and that um, they're expected to release GPT-4, which is supposed to be even better at generating text than previous versions. It talks about how Google has a competitor as well. It's called LAMDA. It's a rival chatbot. And the Silicon Valley is full of startups that are doing this, including another one called Stability AI and another one called Character AI. And so it goes on to say that at many universities, ChatGPT is now vaulted to the top of the administrators and universities agenda. And administrators are establishing task force and hosting worldwide discussions to respond to the tool. So I'll just share a couple more things, uh, Susan, then I'm gonna throw it your way. So it talks about at George Washington University in D.C., Rutgers in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and App State in Boone, North Carolina. Professors are phasing out take-home and open book assignments, which had become dominant in the pandemic. 
They're now opting for in-class assignments, handwritten papers, group work, and oral exam. Here's a quote. Gone are the prompts, like write five pages about this or that. Some professors are crafting questions they hope will be too clever for chatbots to write uh, for chatbots and asking students to write about their own lives and about current events. The last thing I'll say, universities are also aiming to educate students on the new tool. So you have places like the University of Buffalo and Furman that are embedding AI discussions into their required classes. And then you have other universities that are rewriting their own integrity policies. So it mentions WashU in St. Louis, University of Vermont in Burlington, and Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. Um, all three places have are rewriting their whole academic integrity policies and and updating their plagiarism definition to include text written by generative, generative systems. It says more than 6,000 teachers from Harvard, Yale, and Rhode, University of Rhode Island and others have also signed up for GPT-0, a program that promises to quickly detect any AI-generated text, according to the Edward Tian, the creator. So, um, Susan, I want to throw this out to you and ask you, um, where do you think this is going and how concerned should we be? Or do you think that... Um, you know, this is a lot of hullabaloo and, and commotion, and this too will pass. Any any thoughts? Well, it is fascinating, Mark. I don't think I've ever seen anything hit uh, the media and the, the world of education so fast <laughs> and so hard. People have known this is coming. I mean, all of us have dealt with, with chatbots in the last couple of years, and they are, um, in my limited experience, ridiculously unintelligent. You know, when I think of, you know, the websites I go to where there's a bot that tries to answer my questions and, you know, it never can. And so, you know, I agree. <laughs> a while ago, I started looking at, you know, how are, how are these things programmed? And I was also working with high school students who were coding them, you know, who were having class assignments and they're, you know, from computer science and, and some of their engineering about, um, you know, writing the code to make um, a an inanimate um, program responsive in an intelligent way that that mimicked human intelligence. And uh, I had no idea that it had become this sophisticated this fast. Although the number of high school students who are interested in artificial intelligence storming the gates at the Carnegie Mellons and the places that are actually on the, at the cutting edge of, of um, this field of computer science is certainly growing. I think the world of college admissions freaked out pretty quickly about sure. this. I think the world of high school teachers freaked out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think of parallels in my experience. And of course, I remember at our high school, when cell phones were, you know, hitting hard and we as a school were making an effort to keep cell phones out of the classroom, out of <laughs> the dining room. I'm out just of... laughing because I remember those battles and we were losing them. <laughs> ah, it was it was worse than dress code. But, yeah. you know, we as a school, we were determined to not let um uh, human communication degrade because of cell phones. And, you know, now, what, 10 years, certainly less than 20 years later, they iPhones now are a tool that every single teacher uses. And I think we've just thrown, you know, thrown the, the social interaction issue out. You know, the baby goes out with that bathwater. That yeah, that was back in like 05, 06, 07, that cell yeah. phone battle. That's so right. Now almost eighteen years. That's right. Um, so maybe this will become something that you know. We just literally, Dave and I just talked about this. As regular listeners will know, the topic was the the college essay is dead. It was an Atlantic article. It was very provocative. Yep. And then Marine Dowd wrote a rebuttal saying the college admission is not uh, as the essay is not dead. And I still believe that if technology can be used to write 
for lack of a better word, Shakespearean English or whatever, you know, then I think it can also be used to catch it and detect it. And um, I just remain optimistic that the same cre- creativity and then look, look at the creativity. Something people are doing. We'll write it handwriting. We'll do more oral stuff. We'll do more group work. Like some really good things I think can potentially come out of this. I, and that I think is where education has to start going with this. Uh, and uh, someone said on a, on a uh, group, a zoom meeting that I was on with a whole bunch of professionals recently, you know, this is going to be, if you can't beat them, join them um, kind of movement. And how are we going to fold this into into the educational lexicon of children and and young adults? And how are we going to create educational, sound educational uses? You know, pretty much everything we use these days in education has a dark side, right? The internet certainly does. We've learned that the hard way. Uh, cell phones, same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you name it. it, it it's the, YouTube. Where, wherever there is is advancement and opportunity for discovery and education, there's also going to be um, abuses that um, are are very very negative. That said, um, we weren't really prepared for this one to hit the way that it has, and I, I think that what we're going to see is gr- groups of educators writing curriculum for uh, chat GPT, and as each iteration comes out, because the GPT-3 is is actually going to take the current version a step farther to be able to hold an argument. Mm-hmm. Right right now, it's basically a, a narrative reporting tool. I've, u- I've used it, my colleagues have used it to generate essays. Um, I, I have some an opinion about that too. Uh, the, all of us who feel we're not easily fooled will easily be fooled by these GPT essays. What won't fool us as as college counselors, English teachers, essay readers, and college admissions uh, readers is the coherence of applications. And it's exactly what we just talked about, Mark, in the tip, that good, really good writing Um, in a college application, it's not a writing contest. It's not an essay contest. There aren't blue ribbon essays and red ribbon essays. And the essay elevates the application. It's not alone. It's only valuable in how, as we said, clarifies and contextualizes the rest of the application. And I'm reading really well-written essays now. I'm assuming they were written by the applicants. Um, or maybe not, but they have very little relevance. They're really just a demonstration of um, the essay. Partially, the prompts are to blame. And I I believe that that's where this conversation is going to be going with any luck um, in the next year with with the college application world. So, Susan, do you think we'll see the rise of things like graded papers like send a graded paper in to compare, probably only the most selective schools because that's work. Anytime you have work and readers under so, under so much pressure to read so much, you know, that's dollars really because you're having to pay people more for time. And so on the more selective schools can do that without having decreased applications. Princeton had started doing that right when they went to test optional, send a graded paper in. Um, but for all intent, who knows the graded paper could be GPT, but, but I'm thinking... You know, I'm thinking, I'm just thinking there's going to be some creativity. And and do you think it's going to impact the admission cycle this cycle at all? Or do you think, you know, do you think there's there's a lot of talk about it, but it really doesn't have any impact on this year's admission cycle? Well, on the current, the current applications that are under review now, I think it's, you know, colleges aren't going to suddenly start trying to figure out how to deal with it. I, I think colleges are going to have to talk about this for quite a while. Right. The, the uh, faculty are going to have to talk about it at colleges, mm-hmm. and there's going to have to be kind of a consistent um, and and thorough examination of it from the admissions standpoint. I, I think there's a lot that we're going to have to look at. You know, mm-hmm. the, the writing sample that was on the SAT and the ACT for years, we did mm-hmm. away with because it was utterly useless right. and uh, had no validity, uh, but that was before GPT. 
right? We we didn't. Now, have... Let me stop you for a sec. Uh, you you when the, we talked about this last time, and it's, I've actually came up with Dave when that that college essay stayed. I came up a little bit with Vince as well, and and I was talking about different creative things that people could do. I refuse to believe that we're all, we're just defeated by this. Absolutely. And you know, one thing I had said, you know, I'd even said. Well, West Ham for international students, we made them go into our missions conference room and write a 30 minute essay. So we knew nobody else, you know, had, and, you know, there were certain pockets of the country that had, there'd been some widespread cheating in, but, um, of the, the, the world, not the country. So a listener from Texas wrote back. I hadn't even thought of this. And he said, it sounds like you're, you're talking about going back to, to the SAT having the required writing, rewriting again, because that'd be one sort of proctored way of making sure somebody doesn't cheat. And I didn't even think about that. But when he said that, it made, I wasn't actually advocating for that, but that, that certainly would be a one way to make sure chat GPT, but that was such a disaster. I don't think anybody wants to go oh. back to that. And no. they've just gone through another reiteration with digital now. So I don't see. No, Another and, major change. So that's probably not a good option either. And 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 remember all the inequities and the way that that the sure. SAT has since its beginning exposed um, socioeconomic and educational inequities. Mm -hmm. it, the whole writing sample was just so bogus, which was why it it was jettisoned by colleges so quickly. You know, it was mm -hmm. it was nonsense because first of all, colleges really don't care about high school students first drafts they care about the thinking and the uh self-expression that goes into a piece of work that has perhaps gone through several drafts because that's what the kids are going to be doing once they're they're in college so i think the idea of a writing first of all with any luck we're never going back to the sat in large numbers and we'll see how that pans out but i think colleges would be loath to Force a, a timed, un you know unrehearsed writing sample. I think it has value with international students in a different climate. You know, like with mm -hmm. with um, TOEFL or in uh, Initial View. It's mm -hmm. there's a thing. But will something become? Uh, uh, will something come up that will be a little bit like that? So I think, tell people what initial view is. I think that might have gone over most of our listeners' heads there. Tell people what initial view is. Well, initial view is a is a service that has oh I don't know how many how many years old it is. It's not that many years old, but it's a business that um, uh, allows applicants, mostly um, international, uh, living outside the United States, to provide colleges with a a video interview that is conducted by an educator not by someone at a particular college so it's it's not an interview as we know at a college application admissions interview where it's someone representing the college interviewing an applicant this is a third party uh, that it, you know educators who are trained to talk with students in a way that it, it enables the student to demonstrate their oral um, communication skills. It's it's a one on one. Um, what happens is after about a half an hour of conversation, which is a very non threatening, um, you know, kind of uh, low. I mean, I'm sure for the student, it's scary as all get out, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's not an inquisition. Then in the when it's over, the the initial view staff goes through the interview and highlights for the colleges the parts of the interview that they feel are um, worth listening to. So the, a university I used to read applications for had initial view interviews in a lot of that. I, so I got to listen to tons of them. And sure. I could go down and follow the, you know, a minute, you know, th three minutes and six, 24 seconds um student discusses leadership and so you don't have to listen to the whole interview you can kind of uh, follow their lead initial view also provides a um a writing a proctored writing sample 
proctored mm -hmm. in that the person is looking at the student uh, on mm -hmm. the camera. It's not a, in person. So, you know, it's a way, especially for kids in in a lot of countries where there's a lot of suspicion of in, inauthenticity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and falsehood in the application process to bring their application to life and in a way that, and so the students then pick which colleges to receive them. And there are hundreds and hundreds of colleges that subscribe to this service so that the kids can can do that. And I've often, you know, wondered why, you know, we're not doing it in the United States. And of course, then mm -hmm. during the pandemic, Brown and mm -hmm. Chicago, and mm -hmm. I think Hamilton and a few mm -hmm. other schools started inviting video um, introductions. Now those are done specifically for that college. So it's yeah. like, hi, Brown yeah. University, here I am, I'm gonna walk you through my, you know, my robotics lab and show you what I'm working on. And I mean, I um, talked about initial view on here once before, and it was like almost four years ago. Like, oh, it was really wow. Long. We would have to be a listener from a really long time. And who knows if they even remember it. But I it's think, another way of right. another way that some people have thought through the, the authentication of college applicants. So I wonder if we're going to hear more conversations along those lines. I think lines. we are. And I I just refuse to have a defeated view on this that, oh, well, we live in a chat GPT world. And yeah, we do. But I don't, I'm, I'm convinced both professors and admission officers will find creative ways to, uh, yeah. you know, to figure out who's doing their own work versus who's not. And I, I don't I, have a defeatist view of it. Like, yeah, we may need to change some things. We probably will need to change. But I think we will be able to change. I think but we have to. You know, you know, we, yeah. we have to because the technology is only going to become, um, you know, GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And these robotics, these bots are going mm -hmm. to be be part of our lives in, you know, journalism, business communications. Um, they are already being used in in diagnostic medical situations that are a great blessing for practitioners who have to make quick quick evaluations and, you know, let let the bot do some of the thinking for you. It they can't make decisions that they can make recommendations, but they tend to be used to summarize information. And that's what these essays feel like to me, the ones that I've read is, you know, it's kind of garbage in, garbage out, that when you when you give ChatGPT um, a lot of stuff that you want in an essay and the tone of voice that you want, you get you get something that has a very scripted feel and the thing is, is it's going to be a piece of writing. And I was doing this with some of my colleagues um, this last month. How are kids going to make this authentic to other parts of the application? Because that's already a problem with essays that are highly coached. Yeah, um, it really so is. Good coaching doesn't doesn't rewrite students' essays and edit out their voices because the activities list, the the college specific questions the why this major, why this college are, uh, again, as we were saying earlier, there has to be a, a congruency, a, a um, unifying voice and personhood to the application in order for it to make an impression. Because otherwise it's going to be, oh, wow, well, here's another great essay that looks like the kid was coached. Yeah, and I think that sometimes students, parents don't realize, like, if this is what you do, if this is your job as a professional to read whatever number, let's just say 1,000 to 1,500, you know, a year, you get, your skills get good at discernment. And they get refined. And sometimes, you know, you can just sense that this feels a little off. You know, you don't want to be accusatory. Now, we already you know? read essays now, and I have for, you know, sure. five years you read an essay that is um it's a nice piece of writing but mm -hmm. you're not sure it's really adding anything because it doesn't sound like anything else in the application mm -hmm. so they're mm -hmm. not new this isn't kind of a new phenomenon kids kids have been correct you know buying essays taking them out mm -hmm. of books being overcoached mm -hmm. 
-hmm. What I think CBT will do, Mark, and I think the first thing we'll see kids doing is using it to brainstorm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I were an applicant right now, or my, my past self, I would say, you know, I want an, an essay about growing up in the city, but loving animals, particularly mm -hmm. horses, mm -hmm. um, not being from a wealthy family, having to work for my, you know, my riding lessons and discovering that I loved, loved the wild animals too and thought that I might want to study animal behavior in college. So period. That's all. Oh, true, by the way. You just learned a lot of stuff about Susan. <laughs> I did. That was me. And, you know, I actually wrote yeah. that essay. I, I don't know if you could do it so easily. But, you know, I, and I was a, a pretty immature writer at the time, but that was my my heart's desire the, when colleges said write an autobiography. All they used to say is write an autobiographical essay. Tell us about your background. But I did that for ChatGPT, and the the results were – Something I could have used maybe to spark some ideas and to shape my essay, but it would not have reflected my personality because there's a difference between voice and personality, you know, and you, you think of the other parts of the application that would have authenticated my, my background. You know, I, I, so it's, you know, I think we should all do this. I think it's interesting to see how it might benefit us. One of my colleagues said it's going to level the playing field. It's going to give low-income kids a chance to have the same technological advantage. And that's true until GPT starts charging, which is going to be pretty darn soon. Hmm. I think you brought out a really important point that this isn't new. Like you could argue what's the difference between GPT and overcoaching? Like sure, one's technology driven and one has a human, but it's the same basic concept of masquerading and presenting work like it's your own when it's not your own. Right. And that's in a really that's an important point. Well we need to wind down. Um what would last thought, what, what would you want our listeners to take away as their takeaway from this discussion, Susan? Well, you know, to me, Mark, one of the big issues that's been introduced in a lot of these articles is what is plagiarism? Uh, you know, in, in a world mm -hmm. of, and, and again, not new, but, you know, over the last 20 years, um, a lot of universities, a lot of us who work with kids have not revisited kind of the whole topic of academic integrity. And mm -hmm. for a lot of us, this is where this conversation has to go, is mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be an assist. And are there ways that, just like cell phones and just like the internet, that we can begin to frame it in a way? Uh, you know, when I was working as a, a school-based college counselor, we, we brought in Turn It In, you know, Schools sure. did everywhere, and yeah. teachers wanted to be able to see what percentage of a student's paper um, closely matched um, other sources. Mm -hmm. And it was a non-judgmental software, but it it literally would give teachers percentages and specific examples of of written work that had been too closely lifted from other sources, and that's. I think that's where this is going to go. You know, you may have read about the Princeton undergraduate who already brought out software. It's a hilarious, a hilarious article um, about um, Edward Tian at Princeton, who who works in Princeton's natural langu language processing lab, who used GT GPT three to actually write a plagiarism detection response. So these things are going to happen through AI as fast as GPT evolves. And, and I how, firmly believe that. Yeah. I don't know how it's going to keep up with that. And people are poking holes in it, but, you know, not really. It's, and I think what we're going to be able to do is use this work to distance kids, just like turn it in mm -hmm. um, 
Well, I'm turned in is a great example. I'm glad you brought that up. Plagiarism, that we're going to be able to look at some of this software coming out where I think we can put the fear of God in, in, in both high school students and college students about appropriate use. Everyone's going to block it at first because we're scared of it, but we're going to have to find ways to put it in our appropriate use of technology policies. Well, thank you so much, Susan. It's great. And I'm really also glad that you brought out, this is not all negative. There are positive aspects of it as well. And I think you really brought really good balance to this conversation. So I'm already looking forward to your March March discussion. Thank you. See you next month. Bye-bye. Bye. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Okay, friends, if you heard Monday's episode, you know we're going to a new format. Two questions on Thursday, one on Monday, and it's going to be the biggest challenge of my life, Lisa. Can I make them short? <laughs> you can do it, Mark. You can do it. And you know when we did the question on the three P's for priority yeah, visits? Yeah, it was very short. I know. You, you have a track record now. I'm capable, yeah. So, so we're going to do that. And the reason we're doing it, if you didn't hear Monday, is because of how amazing job you guys have done at sending in speed pipe questions. I mean, we have 10 in the kitty right now. And multiple ones are coming. These are really good ones. And so... What we don't want is for you guys to send a question and you don't get an answer until four months later, because sometimes they are time sensitive. So um, let's kick it off uh, today and and uh, dive right in. So you want anything you want to say, Lisa? Um, well, I guess the first thing I want to say is this question is from Nina from Massachusetts. Hi, Mark. This is Nina from Massachusetts. And I was hoping to get your thoughts on when it comes to siblings applying to colleges at the same time, whether it be twins or triplets or more. I've heard that some schools assume that twins want to be together, while others will truly evaluate them independently. When my twins are applying to the same school, do they need to explicitly state that they are okay with an independent evaluation and that they don't expect to be at the same school? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks so much. Bye. So I really want to thank Nita for it, for this question, because I know a lot of people have this question, and I like how she worded it. So she referred to twins or triplets, but she also said siblings. And there are cases where you could have siblings that are not necessarily twins or triplets. I had a situation earlier um, earlier in the year where we had a conversation um, with the family because two students were going to end up in the same grade because of one skipping a grade, even that they weren't twins or triplets. So she's talking about any time you have two kids from the same family um, applying to the same school and how do schools handle it? And the one thing I'll say, like all things, you always want to check for individual policies because policies can vary. Um, but basically you will find that policies fall into two camps. There are schools for whom it is a plus factor, a tipping factor. It is something they try really hard to keep kids together and it's a priority for them. And how much of a priority will vary from school to school. And you'll also find schools that just kind of don't care and treat them completely separate and independent. And you'll find both of those things out there. Um, in general, there is a correlation to the policy and selectivity. So when you get into the most selective schools, they tend just to say, we're going to judge each student completely as an individual. And, and that's going to be the approach that we're going to use. When you come down the selectivity uh, spectrum a little bit, you find a lot more of an, uh, you know, attempt to try to keep them together um, and see it as, you know, every effort to try to do that. But the bottom line is to check both, check out the policies of each individual school. So it's My experience is it's something that schools are transparent with. They don't necessarily feel like you don't have a right to know. So if you ask, you can find out their policy. Um, I do want to say something about the last point she brought out, which was um, should you as an individual let a school know that um, you want them to judge you independently and you're very comfortable being independent. I love my sister, brother, whatever, but I don't need to go to the same school that they go to. And for that, I say absolutely yes. Absolutely, you want to say that because schools are going to have that uh, question in the back of their mind, is this a package deal? 
Like, will, will we yield this student if we don't take the sibling? That's a very common mindset for a school to be in. And, you know, increasingly schools are, are yield conscious. The more they apply to, the lower the admit rate goes down, which leads them to applying to more, which leads colleges to saying, okay, if people are applying to 17 schools from this, um, from this high school, then maybe we'll take a look at which ones are serious about it. So it's this whole vicious cycle. And it is no downside whatsoever for you indicating to a school that you're completely comfortable coming to us, going to a different school from your from your sibling. And you can put that in the additional information section. Another approach that you can use is to, if you have a counselor that has some pros write up, have the have them emphasize that as well. So it's coming from a counselor. Uh, but I would absolutely advocate that students do that. Any thoughts, Lisa? Um, where should they do that? Should they send an email? Should they put it in the additional information section of the Common App? How should they do it? Definitely the additional information section, because one thing schools like is to have everything all together. And the way the way the schools have this set up is your whole Common App just syncs and uploads right into Slate, and they can just read everything all together on their screen. And when you start talking about individual emails, now you're you know now they got to manage that and keep track of that. So um, increasingly, that is becoming the way things were done in the past. It's really moving to, you know, what you submit as part of your official record and what you upload to a portal. And the whole individual email thing, I'm not saying there's not a place for it at all. There certainly are some schools, especially ones that love to build a relationship with the rep and they kind of enjoy that exchange. But um, there are also a lot of schools that used to advise people to do that that are not advising them to do that anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, and it does. And I think that that way this won't, it's important. So it shouldn't get missed. So. Yeah. I want to share uh, an interesting story related to how important yield is getting. And this is, um, I know our listeners are, are going to be listening to this and, and, and they're going to think, what's this, is this like the initial view episode? Because in my conversation with Susan, we talked about initial view for five minutes or six or seven minutes, maybe. And then right after I finished that recording, um, Brennan, Brennan Barter reached out to me with the text and he's like, Mark, you don't know Terry Crawford from Initial View? He's in Atlanta. I'm putting the two to get you together. So Terry Crawford is the founder of Initial View and, and we got together for, for lunch and he's going to be coming on the podcast. That's an interview you're not going to want to miss. But, uh, you know, Initial View is really hot right now, obviously with chat GPT and I mean, other things, you know, the Supreme Court's going to walk back affirmative action and people are using a lot of creative ways to recruit and to confirm authenticity. So one of the things the initial view has is this ability uh, when you complete their interview process with their professional interviewers, you can pick two schools that you star and you only get two. So it's not this high stakes thing like ED where you're obligated, but schools know who stars them. And sometimes some schools are even saying it in their information sessions, like Middlebury, I know, does this, where they'll say, hey, if you're sending an initial view interview, um, we like those stars. So these are some of the creative kind of ways out here that schools are, students are signaling interest and colleges are taking note of who is signaling interest. And it's just part of the way that they're trying to navigate their way through the morass of kids are applying to zillions of schools. Like who's serious about us besides things we've talked about before? Like, you know, did you visit? Do you do the virtual visits? Did you interview? How well did you do the call specific questions? All the things we've talked about before. And so I'm just saying you want to let them know that you're seriously open to coming and you're not a package deal with your, with your student. So anything else on this one, uh, Lisa? I think you did it in under 10 minutes. Ah, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> I think I got happier about that than like one of the major things. I can do uh, this. I can do this. I'm capable. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Let's go to question number two. All right. This question comes from Amanda, who is in Texas. Hi, Mark. Thank you for your podcast. I listen to every episode and I have learned so much. A question that I've had for quite a while now is about leadership in highly selective schools. 
I'm just really curious why that seems to be one of the most important factors in gaining admission. It seems like there would be a place for all kinds of students, and I don't understand why a school would necessarily want all of their students to be strong leaders. Is there not a place for different kinds of students? Is there not a place for the maybe the more quiet, hard workers who will show up and put in work, uh, who might lead by example. I just don't understand why that seems to be one of the like ultimate qualities that highly selective schools have. And um, you know, with all of the talk about diversity and wanting different kinds of students on campus to have the best learning lab, it just seems to me that that is an area that's not diverse. So if you would just help me understand that, uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And once again, I just love our listeners. They just ask such amazing questions. And so, you know, I have had this thought before, uh, Lisa, which is, boy, you know, schools are really hitting this leadership thing hard. I wonder how that sounds to somebody who's out there. I wonder if that comes off like I'm toast if my kid's not a leader. Like, I remember thinking that before. And so to hear her artic- articulate it the way she does, I-, I just always had that suspicion that that was a perception was being was being generated out there. And so, uh, so let me share a few thoughts on this, uh, because I think a lot of people have this question. So one thing I've learned as a communicator is an example or a well-written articulated analogy is better than a whole lot of words. A picture is worth a thousand words. So I try, you know, to use analogies and examples whenever I can. Sometimes they flop. Sometimes they land. So I hope this one will land and not flop. We'll see. You you all can be the judge. I'm glad it's not Anika because I flopped a lot with her. Anyway, <laughs> so in, in football, there's a lot of hype about the quarterback. Quarterback, quarterback, quarterback from a recruiting standpoint. Colleges are always trying to get quarterbacks. 33 of the last 43 Heisman Trophy winners, which is given supposedly to the best player in college football, have been quarterbacks. And so many times in the NFL drafts, quarterbacks go one, two, or three. And so you could easily get the sense, like, Snap is the only thing that matters, the quarterback. And then lately, there's been a lot of talk about offensive tackles that block, the, protect the quarterback from getting sacked and injured. Or there's been a lot of talk about defensive ends because they're the one that gets to the quarterback and knocks them out. I know. I probably picked a bad <laughs> illustration for Lisa. <laughs> you saw my eyes glazing over. <laughs> yeah. This one I should probably need a Dave on. But it, anyway. I'm following you. I'm good, following good, you. Good, good, good. Awesome. Without those other players, the quarterback wouldn't be able to do their job because they'd be smushed flat as a pancake. Yeah. And schools need tons of other people. They need wide receivers. They need safeties. They need punters. You know, they need kickers, they need offensive tackles and offensive guards, and and it just goes on and on and on. But one of the reasons why a quarterback is valuable is because a really good leader brings out the best in everyone else. A really good leader allows someone to reach their full potential. And colleges, what they're actually looking for is significant impact, and it's hard for them to find really good leaders. So it's not that they want everybody to be a leader. It's more like that coach just says, I'm looking for a quarterback because it's hard for me to get a really, really good one. And if I get a really, really good one, you're going to help make everybody better. So there's a difference between I want everybody to be a quarterback versus, boy, if we can get a really, really good one, that's going to elevate the dorms. That's going to elevate the classroom. That's going to elevate everything. And in that emphasis on trying to get a really good one, it can come across like everything, everybody else is chop liver, if that makes any sense. And so... I just want to share some of the other things that are highly, highly valuable to a school other, other, than, other than leadership. And so if you've been listening for a while, um, I did, um, and in the news with Dave, I think it was Dave, uh, back on episode 120, and you'll remember this one, Lisa, it was Rebecca Sabke talking about the editorial she wrote um, to the New York Times on on the janitor, and it was the best recommendation she said she ever received in 13 years at Dartmouth. And so um, I'm just going to read a little bit of an excerpt from, I know, here we go, me reading, you know, from uh, (laughs) from the New York Times article that she she wrote. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'll try to make it interesting. I'll try. <laughs> so here's what she says. She says, and especially if you never heard this, even if you did, I think it's so powerful that it'll still be worth mentioning. So here's what she said. I'm just reading, not reading the whole lot bad, but she said, every year I'd read over 2,000 college applications from all over the world. The applicants are always intellectually curious and talented. They climb mountains. They hit extracurricular clubs. They develop new strategies. They're the next generation's leaders. They Their accomplishments stack up quickly. The problem is in a, in a deluge of promising candidates, many remarkable students become indistinguishable from one another, at least on paper. It's incredibly difficult to choose who to admit. Yet with all the chaos of test scores and extracurriculars recommendation, one quality is always irresistible in a candidate. And then here's the key thing, Lisa. She doesn't say leadership. She says kindness. Kindness. It's a trait that would be hard to pinpoint on applications, even if colleges ask the right questions. Even so, though, it can't help but come shining through. Then she says the most surprising indication of kindness I ever had came in my admissions career from a student who went to a large public school in New England. He was bright. Um, He had supportive recommendations from his college counselor, impressive ECs. With all these qualifications, he might not have stood out, but one letter caught my eye. It was from the school custodian. And then she says, letters of recommendation are typically superfluous written by people who the applicant thinks will impress the school. We regularly get letters from former presidents, celebrities, trustees, Olympic athletes. They generally fail to provide us with another angle on the student. This one was different. The custodian wrote that he was compelled to support the student's candidacy because of his thoughtfulness. Here's the quote. This young man was the only person in the school who knew the names of every member of the janitorial staff. He turned off lights in empty rooms. He consistently thanked the hallway monitor each morning. He tidied up after his peers, even if nobody was watching. This student, the custodian wrote, had a refreshing respect for every person at the school, regardless of their position, popularity, or clout. And then she goes on to say, over 15 years and 30,000 applications in my career, I'd never seen a recommendation from a school custodian. He gave us a window into the student's life, and basically the student was unanimously voted. So the reason why I said that is it wasn't leadership. That's something that an introvert could do. And other personal qualities are highly valued as well. Kindness is one. Curiosity is one. Grit is one. Positive attitude is one. Adventurous spirit, adventurous and spirit is one. Being a glue kid is one. The, the, the teacher that talks about how the student's writing is some of the best writing they've ever seen or how it challenges the teacher. The student who brings everybody together. The student who's the peacemaker when chaos breaks out. Um, the student who writes a column in the newspaper that becomes hot topics on campus. What causes one is impact, and it can be done in many different things. It doesn't have to come through leadership. In fact, one thing colleges are very conscious of is that they're not just going after this collection of extroverts. So there was a while ago when college admission officers were all reading the book Quiet, and they were doing book studies on it, and then they were coming together to make sure that they weren't missing the power. The book Quiet talks about the secret power of introverts. And one thing that admission officers are always doing is going through anti-bias training to make sure that they're not always looking for somebody, somebody like themselves. So what are your thoughts, Lisa? Well, you know, I do think that um, I think that high school and college admissions and kind of in many ways, professional success favors extroverts. And you've said that a lot. I, I well, as an introvert, I really see that, you know, um, whether it's from like the grades that you get from participating in class or you know, um, you know, demonstrating your leadership abilities in a club. I mean, that involves speaking out and being in front of a lot of people and a lot of, you know, many people can contribute in a lot of different ways. So I really valued Amanda's question. And I guess the thing is, if that is not what is comfortable for you, then to think about other ways where you can make that impact. Um, you know, and there's plenty of ways a quiet person can, you know, do like activities or volunteerism that is extremely helpful and very powerful, but it's just something you have to be conscious of. Yeah. And the reason why I I took some time to read that is because what that student did didn't require amazing leadership. It didn't even require being an extrovert, turning off the hallway lights, cleaning up. 
And so I want, but yet she said this was the most powerful letter in her almost 15 years. Unanimously voted. So I just wanted to use it as an example of how other things are valued, even if there's a lot of hullabaloo and hype around leadership. And kindness really is one of those super powerful things that is so valued. I was just talking, I can't even remember who it was, but I was talking with somebody knowledgeable a few days ago about how many, oh, it was Julia. You know, Julia and I were talking about how many questions this year were asking, you know, about like, can you transcend cultural differences in the call specific questions? Can you get along with people who are different from you? You know, like clearly colleges are valuing that. And, and so like that, there were more questions this year around that than there were about leadership by far, maybe 10 to one. So the point I'm making is that while it may seem like leadership at times is the only thing that colleges value, it's real. It's really not. It's a lot more. So, and, and anything else on that? Or do you think we, we took care of that one? I think we took care of that one. And ten minutes again. And ten minutes. <laughs> I can do this to an episode. I'm capable. You can. You did a great job. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, I really hope you've got to hear part one and part two of the interview with Dr. Kelly Holloway to realize just what a special place Mercer is. And in our final part, we spend a lot of time talking about their admissions process. And of course, I put her on the hot seat. Listen and enjoy. And when you're admitting students, are you admitting them into specific majors, into colleges within the university, or just into Mercer as a whole? Um, we, we do admission into Mercer University as a whole. With the exception of engineering, there is a additional layer, an additional step. Um, most specifically, like I shared, um, a student, we do want to make sure that they are calc ready, um, calculus ready, um, if they're an engineering student. And so it could be that you apply as an engineering student and you are eligible for admission to Mercer, but may not be eligible immediately for engineering. Um, but all other programs, every other major here at Mercer, um, it is um, admitted to the university at large, and then a student can select their major. Now, are there majors that they need to qualify to get into once they're at Mercer? Like if they no. want to do business, they need to get a certain GPA? Is it, is it set up like that or not? No, it is all direct. So if they apply as a business student and are admitted to Mercer University, um, we they are directly admitted into the School of Business. That's awesome. Yes. Let's talk about some other things. Um, interview, is that part of your process at all? The interview is not a part of the admission process. However, um, about our uh, the top 10% of our applicants are invited to our presidential or our heritage scholars events, and those are interview-based. And so it's not for admission, but it is for additional merit scholarship ranging up to full tuition. And um, that is where um, students and their families are invited to campus, uh, and they are um, they are they they have the opportunity to engage with us and learn about programs and things like that, but also to interview with uh, faculty, staff, alumni, and community members. And I don't know if you still do this, but I had a chance to sit down with one of your mission officers for about two hours in her office um, in 2016. Okay. And at that time, most students were getting seventeen to twenty thousand in merit. I mean, nine to nine to twenty, kind of. But a lot of students were kind of getting in that seventeen to yeah. twenty range. Do you still have a sizable number of students getting, you know, decent merit money like that? Yes, we absolutely do. Our merit scholarships, at the time that a student's evaluated for admission, they're also considered for merit scholarship as well. Our scholarships range um, from ninety five hundred a year to twenty five thousand a year. So th at the time that they receive an admission letter, they're also going to receive that it, that initial merit letter as well. And on average, our students um, would cover between seventy and ninety five percent of their tuition and fees to attend Mercer. Um, so Mercer is very very generous um, and very. Um, intentional on um, assisting our students from a financial perspective as well. Um, we serve a very diverse 
socioeconomic status um, uh, student. Yeah, talk uh, talk to us a little bit about the sort of the composition of the student body when it comes to diversity, both socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, anything else you want to share? Absolutely. Um, I would be happy to. Um, I, As a first generation college uh, graduate myself, I'm always really proud to share that um, a, a little over 25 percent, about 29 um, percent of our uh, students are first generation, um, which for an academic profile that we have um, is not yeah, always is, 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 yeah. is a pretty high. Um, mm-hmm. and, and knowing that we serve um, a large portion of students who are first gen is is really incredible, really phenomenal. Um, all, uh, almost 30 percent of our student population are Pell eligible, um, wow. meaning that they are um, uh, students that have the, the greatest financial need. Um, so uh, we're, we're really, really proud of that as well. And uh, uh, about 50 percent of our student population are non-white. Um, so we serve a student population that is nearly mirror the demographic makeup of the state of Georgia, um, which we're really, really proud of. No, you should be. And even like the, you know, the Pell, you don't, you don't usually see schools that are as strong as you are academically with those Pell Grant numbers. I mean, 33 to 34% of the country is Pell, you know, and you're getting close to mirroring that as well as, like you said, 50% non-white. So um, that's fantastic. Um, Talk about a couple other things that sometimes schools look at. One is demonstrated interest and what role that plays, if if any, in decisions. And another is the particular high school that the student is coming from. Uh, Can you comment on either of those or both? Sure, sure. Um, In terms of demonstrated interest, it's not, um, that is not a component that we look at to make an admission decision. So um, th- it is not uh, it-, it is not um, a factor whenever we are saying yes or no uh, in in an admission standpoint. Um, it can make a difference, however, um, for a student who is on wait list, um, whether or not they, they've visited. So that can come into play um, a little bit later. Um, we will look at, okay, has this student ever visited campus? Have they ever engaged with us? Um, are, you know, do, do they really um, have an interest in coming to Mercer? Um, we, will, we will look at that. Um, and then also, um, though not directly um, tied to merit scholarship, it is something that um, a student who is engaged with us, who communicates with us, who answers the phone when we call, who replies to the email that signs up for the things that we offer, um, a student who is engaged is a student who is going to be um, more uh, top of mind and recognized for scholarship opportunities as they come up. And so it's not as if there's any formulaic way that demonstrated interest is played in, but it certainly is one that um, our student, our counselors um, take into consideration when scholarship opportunities become available. I don't know if you still do this, but you used to do something that really impressed me. Your your counselors would pick up the phone and call students that were in their territory. We absolutely still do that. Um, we absolutely still do that. Our, our, our team is busy working on that right now with our admitted students that we just admitted for Early Action 1, um, and they got those decisions on November 16th. We are very, um, we're very intentional about creating open dialogue and and open communication. So it's not always transactional. It's not always, hey, Mark, I'm calling because you've got to get this deadline or I'm calling because you got to complete this form or whatever it is. It it can also be, hey, Mark, I'm calling just because I want to hear how your day is going and what's going on with you and what are the things that you're curious about and things like that. So um, we we absolutely make um, a, a concerted effort to connect with our students and get to know them and and their families and their and their parents as well. Um, we talk to probably probably now we talk to just as many, if not more, parents as we do students. No, that's great. That's great. And I used to do that. I used to do boarding school admissions, and I used to love to call people and let them know they're admitted. Like that's old school stuff. Oh my that, gosh, it's so isn't it it's fun? So fun. It's so fun. I love and it. And it's so, but it's so rare in the college world these days. Yes. Don't see a lot of people do it. And 
I think it's actually really smart because you really can stand out. I mean, you know, yeah. from your competitors. So that's great. I'm glad you're still doing that. We so are. I think it's obvious to our listeners. I'm a huge Mercer fan. I really, you know, I wanted you guys to come on for three years and I just kept procrastinating, but no place is perfect. And you know that, and I know that I tell students that your high school is not perfect. Your family's not perfect. Your college won't be perfect. What does Mercer need to work on to be a better school? That is a good question. Um, and there's always something, and, and we prescribe to and have a core value of what we say is continuous improvement. And so we are very much an institution that that values and knows that that we have to continue to evolve and we have to continue to um, appeal to others. We have to continue to to find opportunities for our students. I think um, you actually mentioned one of those that I, that I'll highlight as well is that. Um, we are an institution that serves a large portion of uh, a large portion of our students come from the state of Georgia. Eight, between eighty and eighty-five percent uh, come from the state of Georgia, um, and our opportunity and the, the way that we um, can continue to improve that is to continue expanding beyond our state's borders. Um, I think that that's um, one of the things that we are committed to and we're seeking to be intentional on and um, every opportunity that we have to share the Mercer story um, beyond this state um, is is an opportunity that we're 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 seeking to seize are you finding any areas where you're, you're seeing you're making inroads like oh we're starting to make inroads like in the Chicago market or in you know, Dallas market or, you know, are you, where are you starting to experience that? Cause I used to be over recruitment and recruitment policy and, ph- and philosophy. And I know what it's like to try to break into an area mm-hmm. and, 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 but I know that once you do it and you get some families and they're wearing the t-shirt and they're talking you up that all of a sudden it can just start to grow. Yeah. So where are you experiencing some success? We have, we do have to, success with our, our border States um, most specifically. So um, both of the Carolinas, Alabama, sure. Tennessee, Florida is where um, most of our out-of-state students are coming from. Um, and um, I think that that's kind of wh- where where we see the most. Um, sure. And uh, and then we have some pop-ups. You know, we have some students that, that, that come to Mercer that are coming out of uh, that are coming out of Chicago. Uh, we have some that are coming out of different parts of Ohio, um, out of Texas, out of um, the the metro DC area, and into Northern Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, that those areas, uh, and in the uh, in you know a few that that come every year, even from California as well. So um, they're absolutely here. They're a part of our campus and um, a, a a growing international population as well. Um, but uh, that's an area that we're continuing to work on. So if we were to look at your strategic plan, what, what would it say are some points of emphasis for the, you know, for the future in terms of the big vision stuff? Yeah, we are, um, we have a 10 year strategic plan called Inspire, and we are very focused in this str- strategic plan um, to continue to be a global university. Um, and what I mean by that is not only um sending our students to do important work across the developing country through our program, Mercer on Mission and other study abroad activities and so forth, but also to um, engage those students and bring them to our campus as well. So you would see um, a good bit of that um, and for us to continue to compete with the best um, in every aspect of who we are through athletics, through undergraduate research, through um, you know, competing for the best and the brightest students, competing for the best and the brightest faculty and staff. Um, we are we are never an institution that's going to shy away from from those things, and we find great strength in competing with the best. Do you have any idea why the Fisk guy does not have Mercer in there? I literally said something about it about two months ago on the podcast. I was like, how can the Fisk guy not know. have Mercer? In there. I mean, I know Princeton Reviews had you guys for like 20 years. Yes. You know, you know what, Mark? Um, you've stumped me. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look at that. Yeah. they Because if you were to get in there, you know, that would be some great publicity. And okay. You, sh- you should be in there. I look at, I won't mention names, but there's some play p- people that are in there that have no business being in there over you. So I just, okay. Just bothers me. <laughs> okay. Well, you've given me my homework. I'll get on it. There you go. 
<laughs> All right. Um, we're getting ready to transition to the lightning round. But before we do, anything about Mercer you haven't shared that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, I, I, I think I've shared it well is that, that Mercer is a school uh, that, that cares deeply about who our students are as individuals and allowing them to explore and allowing them to um, connect to resources, connect to faculty, connect to projects, connect to internships, connect to careers, connect to our alumni. Um, and we want to be able to do that for as many students as we can. Yeah, listeners, it's a, it's a place that cares. It's a place that's got community. And it's a high academic institution where the bar is set high. Uh, people will be very, very well prepared. Um, so um, hopefully we'll get some visitors for you from this podcast. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, the recommended resource for episode 299 is a website called acceptancerate.com. And what acceptancerate.com does, it has the most accurate data when it comes to statistics. You pretty much can get acceptance rates for pretty much any college that it's accredited here. They use the best data available. So they're using IPEDS data. That's the Integrated Post-Secondary Educational System data. They're using NCS data. That's National Center for Educational Stats. They're using BLS data, that's Bureau of Labor and Statistics, and they're using Carnegie Foundation data for the advancement of teaching. Uh, They've come up with a unique method where they can give a sense of what the average high school GPA is for admitted students, and that can be helpful to have. And they they at least have, not all their schools, but have it put for a pretty large sample size. So one of the ways to use this website is if you're looking for some really good likelies to add to your list, you can go on and you can target schools with higher admit rates and bigger ranges when it comes to GPAs and test scores if you're looking for that. I like it a lot. I actually recently found it, but I've been using it myself um, to identify some schools when I'm looking for those good probables uh, for students before I go do more research. So it's just acceptancerate.com. It's our recommended resource for episode 299. Now I turn the final part of my interview Kelly Holloway. All right, Kelly, you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. Let's do it. (laughs) All right. If you had to move somewhere, you can't be in Georgia or PA, two places you've been before. Where are you going? Oh, my gosh. If I had to move somewhere, um, I don't want to move. Um, (laughs) I I know. You got used to the weather here and everything, the cost of living and everything. Same for me. Yeah, I I probably would be in in a border state to Georgia. I enjoy this weather. I enjoy this community um, and also being closer to family. There you go. How do you relax and have fun? I have two children. um, So relaxing is not always it. (laughs) Uh, I have a four-year-old and a 16-month-old. So relaxing is not always a part (laughs) of uh, my my time. Um, But my my family and I uh, really enjoy going to the North Georgia and Western North Carolina mountains. Um, That's that's our getaway. That's our 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 kind of happy place. We like to go um, and just get away and and be in a quiet area, um, really beautiful scenic area and um, spend to spend time with uh, our extended family in that area. So which what particular place there's your favorite to go? Uh, we go um, around Hiawassee, Georgia, uh, and around Lake Chattoog. Um, it is uh, All these near places. Me- I don't know. <laughs> is that like past Helen in that area, or it's past Helen? It's on the border between Georgia and North Carolina. My husband's okay. family is just over the border in North Carolina, and uh, so we are, we we spend a good amount of our time on uh, holiday weekends and uh, any long weekend that we might be able to get away. And we, we um, are there um, in an Airbnb, um, beautiful go. mountain views with a lake. Um, it's just, uh, oh, it's wow. just our happy place. Is that part of the Appalachian re- re- uh, region? It is. Range? It, is? Wow. it is. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, you know, I pick up vacation ideas from these, you know? Yes. <laughs> All right. So you can't be in education what other profession would be appealing to you? Uh, education is so broad. I, if I, I, know. If I weren't, if I weren't in education in any way, shape, or form, um, I think I would. Um, I think I would be in public relations. There you go. There yeah. you go. 
You have to go see a concert. Who are you going to see? My favorite was Maroon 5. Um, I I really like Maroon 5. I think that they put on a great show. Um, I, I I would love to go and see them again. Cool, cool. You uh, can meet anybody for lunch. Two, two, double, two questions here. Somebody who is deceased and someone who's alive. Who are you picking? Um, I am very um, intrigued and have enjoyed uh, both books. Um, so alive would be Michelle Obama. Um, and just reading her uh, her current book, The Light We Carry, um, and um, I just admire so much about. Um, her and her philosophies on life and how she has um, conducted herself professionally and as a parent. And um, I just think it'd be fascinating to have an opportunity to. You and a um, lot of people. She probably make a lot of, lot of uh, lists. <laughs> she is uh, phenomenal in so many ways. And I would enjoy that quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, no longer living um, a family member, my, my, my grandmother. I'd love there to you go. spend time with her again. Good for you. Good for you. Somebody comes to Macon to visit Mercer. What restaurant do you recommend? Oh, well, there's so many, so many um, different ones um, that I would recommend. I think if you wanted something that was very um, authentic, Macon and uh, Southern uh, and uh, that kind of feel, I would, recommend uh, Dovetail. Um, it's a um, farm to table, fine Southern dining restaurant, and it's right in the heart of downtown Macon. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, there's a number of different restaurants, so it just depends on what kind of thing that you're looking for. What kind well, of I'm going to take you up on that one because, okay, you know, obviously Mercer's right off 75. So, you know, a lot of times if I'm shooting down to Orlando yes. or whatever, I'm going right by you guys. So, yeah. Dovetail. Well, you let me know. Dovetail is, is fantastic. Kinjo um, is a is an Asian infused restaurant that Ooh. I really love. Um, Pearl, um, if you want something more like burgers, which are really prominent here, um, the Rookery or Okmulgee Brew Pub. There's so many good places. I love it. This is definitely a foodie town. You know, I I'm gonna ask you one. I was done with the college admission stuff, but I did think of a question that I didn't ask. How would you say the political ideology is on the campus? You know, I really think that um, I really, really think that this is a community that um, embraces every ideology. I do not think that there is a, you know, very predominant um, political ideology. We're very invested in our students being politically active in voting. We're consistently winning every like voter registration competition and so forth. Um, so that is that is very pervasive across our campus community, both faculty, staff, students um, at large. Um, but I think that this is really a, a a community that that is a community of respect, and we have people from every walk of life. This is this is what I'm asking. I should ask it more directly. If there was like a mock election taken mm-hmm. of the students. Like, how do you think that would break down like 70, 30, 50, 50? You know, what is your sense? You know, I really think it probably might be close to a 50, 50. I mean, we really have students from every political ideology um, and just a tremendous respect. I have seen and witnessed it firsthand, just the respect and the understanding um, that that our students and our faculty have within the classroom and outside of the classroom as well. Well, you're to be commended for that because the same way the country's divided, that's happening on a lot of college campuses. And that's why there's so many questions that are asking about that to try to, you know, try to break down those divisions. And so, um, yeah, I I really see um, this campus community way more than anything that you're going to see on social media or in just Mm -hmm. the general public is very much a community that has respect and understanding and seeking of truth. Good, good. What's a book that you really would strongly recommend that parents read? Hmm, for anything parents related, read. anything, anything at all related to college or, you know, anything come to mind or, or just anything? A book that um, I really, really enjoyed that I think college students in particular would benefit tremendously from is the book Think Again by Adam Grant. 
And it is all about the power of um, learning what, uh, rethinking and learning what you might already know. Wow. And so it is very much a book about how how do we make decisions and how do we think through things and how do we rethink and how do we learn? It, it's 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 really a a book about how do you how 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 does one go about learning? Um, and I so like I, the name. I, I'm intrigued. I, I I really really like it. And what I have found in my own education, the the further I have gone in a, in formal education, the more I learn, the more I realize I have yet to learn. And yeah, I think if you, um, not only in formal education and, you know, earning a degree in a college setting, but just in life in general is that the more, the more we learn how to learn, the better we're all going to be. Mm-hmm. All right. Last question. Um, but it's a three folder and that is your best advice to students, parents, and college counselors. Get engaged and talk to your representatives. Um, ask questions. Don't shy away from it. Don't assume that you know because you read the website. Don't assume that you know because you got a pamphlet or a letter, um, but actually engage with them. Visit campus, answer the phone call, ask the question, be engaged in the experience. And that, that can apply to all three groups, I guess. Yeah. You know? Um, great. Well, listen, this has been fantastic, Kelly. I'm so thankful for you coming on. Um, yeah. leave our listeners with Mercer's website as well as any other resource, whether it's a social media, um, opportunity or an event or that you would recommend for someone that really wants to pursue Mercer more and get to know it more and learn more about, you know, sure. Mercer. so direct us where we should go next. Well, come and visit us on our website, mercer.edu. Um, if you're specifically interested in uh, admissions, um, just admissions.mercer.edu. And one of the best ways to kind of see and experience who Mercer is through the eyes of a student is to connect with us on Instagram at Mercer Now. Um, that is one of the ways that you can not only learn about the admission process, but also get a feel for and understand who our students are and the campus community. Um, of course, I'd love to be able to host anybody that is interested in visiting. Um, we'd love to have you here on our campus so that we can so, uh, you know, show you and um, engage with you and talk with you and get to know you one on one and see that this is a good fit for um, for students and for for you. Thank you once again for being so generous with your time. I know you got a 16 month old over there and another baby and you got classes and you, you know, this is I guess you guys are into file reading now and. We are. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to, to talk and talk all things college admissions and about Mercer. Awesome. All right. All right. I'll be in touch, Kelly. Thanks. Bye. Bye. And now it's time for our college spotlight of the week. Linda, you ready to do Pomona College? You know I'm always ready to go back to Southern <laughs> California. <laughs> yeah, um, this is a special place. Another place that I've been to four times since 2012. Uh, but but I still learned a lot on this trip because 2012, I went, Karis and I, like the school she looked at. I was look, going as a parent after she had just finished 10th grade. And then my other two times when I was there in 14 and 17, it was it was me on campus talking with students randomly like I like to do. I didn't go through the whole formal thing like, you know, this is like a half day with all the panels and everything. So I saw some changes. One of the changes I saw were facility upgrades. Like they always had incredible facilities, but I, I, there were a couple of buildings that were just unbelievable. And I'm like, I don't remember that. And I said to the tour guide, when did that go up? And it was like 2017. So a lot of people don't realize this, but in terms of endowment per student, if you take... Um, any school of 500 students and above, it is sixth in the country, sixth. And who's ahead of it? Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, MIT, that's it. So they're loaded. Over $2.7 billion endowment for a, a population that ranges between like 17 and 1800, all undergrads. So they're the, they're the, Cornerstone, you know, I talked about how Pitzer was the baby, CMC was the middle child. 
This is the grandpa. This is the old dude. The so, OG. Li- yeah, the OG. <laughs> I mean, I mean, 18, founded in 1887 by Congregationalists. Um, it was done to bring, you know, an Amherst or a Williams type of school to the West Coast. And that was that was the intention. And um, I would say that they have pulled it off incredibly successfully, but yet with a complete California flair. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a, in a second. But um, the interesting thing is um, they started out with a little rental house in the city of Pomona, which is just, you know, really close to Claremont. Pomona is 4.4 miles south of Claremont. But they had an opportunity to get some adjacent land at an unfinished hotel um, in Claremont. And so they moved to Claremont, but the name Pomona stuck. And so they kept Pomona, the name. And then in the 1920s, Pomona President James Blaisdell, he really put them on the map because he had a very difficult choice to make. Uh, What was he going to do? Was he going to limit the expansion to, to retain the very unique feel that Pomona had, or it was going to allow growth. And he actually decided to go in a third direction, which was using Cambridge and Oxford as models, form a consortium, unlike anything else in America. And so now you have, I'm not going to go over the consortium because I've talked about it at length in each of the other episodes, but on one square mile, slowly they started building, you know, scripts in the 20s. And then Harvey Mudd, which we still have coming up next, um, and scripts. We're the next two. And then, uh, of course, of course, Pitzer. So um, this place is absolutely gorgeous. And it's kind of got a unique sort of Spanish Mediterranean, totally California style with aspects of sort of elite New England when it comes to buildings. And I, I want to share a story that to me, this is one of these things where it's like 17 years old. But it, I feel it's as true today as it was 17 years ago. So maybe it was 18, 17 or 18 years ago. I was I was still doing the same thing I do now, Linda. Go on college campuses and just start talking to kids. So I was doing that at SWAT, Swarthmore, which was only about 20 miles from um, West Town School where I was you know, working and living. And I started having a great conversation with this student at SWAT. And I found it so fascinating to talk to him because he had come from Pomona. So Pomona has a domestic exchange program. Um, and they still have it. They have it, they have it with with really just four schools. They have it with Spelman in Atlanta, with Swarthmore College in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, Colby College in Maine, and then they have a semester in environmental science. It's like an ecosystem program they have in Massachusetts. And small like five kids do that one. And I'm talking with this guy, um, you know, and I'm asking him all kinds of questions, like how's Pomona different than Swarthmore? And the thing that he kept emphasizing was Pomona does not have the intensity. It does not have the intensity. It is academic, and people might think it's not as academic, but it's academic in a laid back way. And that really is Pomona. It's got, you know, I always say it's so important when you're looking at school to understand the history of the school, the mission of the school, and the location. And all of those things forge who a school is. And there's so many ways in which in which the Claremont location, where you're right by the San Gabriel Mountains and you can go to the beach and you can be at the desert. Um, you can hop a train, you're 35 miles east of LA, get the light rail and be in there. It's got that chill California vibe about it, even that it's wicked, smart, ambitious kids. It just doesn't have that intensity. And I personally think it's way better for mental health. I feel like they know how to work hard and play hard there. And they know how to take their academics very seriously, but still like laugh at themselves and relax and have some fun. And I really feel what that student said to me back then really captures the essence of what I feel when when I when I'm on the campus. And so, you know, I obviously have a lot more to say, but any thoughts so far? Well, let me tell you my Pomona story. So, uh back during the pandemic days, uh we had a snow day and Pomona 
uh, had a day long virtual session. And it was, it was really like six hours long. And it was when my daughter was looking at schools. So, so we attended, at least I did for all six hours. She kind of, wow, you are dedicated. I was dedicated because they, they covered everything. And I went back and I, I looked at some of my notes uh, about Pomona from from that time. And some of the things that that really struck me were uh, the students kept saying transformative, how transformative uh, the the experience had been attending, uh, that it was collaborative, uh, diverse, and just everything was flexible from the curriculum, uh, working with professors, all of the opportunities. I came away from from that day wanting to take a vacation at Pomona. Um, Forget about going to school. It just sounds like a wonderful place, uh, truly. Well, I'll tell you, Dave had a similar reaction because Dave did look at Pomona and Harvey Mudd for Lauren. And I remember him calling me when he got back there and he was like, can we just end our college search like right now? And can he just go to this place? And even to this day, he'll make comments about it. Like, Yale is nice, but give me Pomona. Um, it really does feel like uh, a lot of ways the uh, closest thing to heaven on earth. And I, I don't hate to say that because I know no place is perfect, but but it's close to it as far as the college goes, as far as setting and resources. And the seafood that they talked about, um, the grand pianos in the dorms, um, it, it all sounded pretty darn nice. In addition to the amazing academics. No, they have fantastic facilities. They do have very, very good food. And they do have palatial dorms. Not all, but many. And I, I want to tell, I want to share another tradition about Pomona. And this will, I think, give people a sense. So somewhere back, some scholar, this goes back to a long time ago, like the 20s or something, um, in the math department said that was commented on how often the number 47 is is used in different things. So Pomona basically has adopted the number 47 as their number. And they do all kinds of things related to 47. So for example, one of the things they do on 4-7, right? Get it? 4-7, April 7th. They cancel classes and they order all these zip lines and all these food trucks to just celebrate four slash seven, but they're always doing 47 things. Here's another thing they do. And this is a famous thing at Pomona. You have 47 things to do at Pomona before you graduate. That's like a thing when you come in, the 47 things on the to-do list. And basically there are a series of trips all over Southern California and all over the place, right? And the most famous one on the 47 things to do is what they call a ski beach day. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. So you start out skiing on Mount Valley in the morning and you end up surfing on the beach in the afternoon. (laughs) Pretty tough life, isn't it? (laughs) That is a tradition I can get behind. I like that one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What I love about Pomona are the resources Most of this trip I talked about is completely subsidized. So low-income students can attend. They can do the skiing, which could be expensive. And they're a big Questbridge school. So that's a sizable community. They're one of about 20 colleges that claim to meet need blind and meet full demonstrated need and do it without loans. If you're having mental health needs and you need counseling, they're incredibly generous with what they provide and what you have to pay for that. They put their endowment to work to give kids some really unique opportunities that a school without these resources could never really do. Let's talk about a couple examples. Since 1976, they've had a program called PCIP. That stands for Pomona College Internship Plan. So PCIC provides students with a generous stipend so they can do unpaid experiential learning opportunities on a part-time basis throughout like the greater LA area and the Inland Empire. Um, They also have something called PCIP semester um, every spring and fall. And since 2011, they've had the PCIP summer experience. And what they do here is they provide funded international and domestic internships 
And I mean like 900 of them. Uh, because working the summer is so important for so many students to get ahead. And if they maybe lack the resources and they need to make money over the summer, it allows students to actually have an internship and to get paid with a stipend that covers cost of living, travel expenses. In the summer of 2022, 114 students got these remote internship experiences. So once again, I really do have a bias towards schools that are flush with money because of the kinds of ways they can invest in students. Um, but just some other things uh, about Pomona. And I have a lot. I'm going to save a lot of what I'm going to say actually about Pomona when I get into what kind of student I recommend and who I recommend it for. Um, and also I'll save a lot of a lot of my points I want to make there. But, you know, they're really strong academically across the board. They, they really, really are. If there's one thing that surprised me that I learned on this trip, I didn't pick this up before, is how much interest is in computer science there. And I guess it just reflects how much computer interest is in computer science across the country. It is their third most popular major by number of graduates. But in talking to admission officers, it would be a lot higher based on the number of applicants they actually got. They have to take major into consideration as a factor. Otherwise, they would just have way too many CS majors and probably too many econ majors as well. It is also the one that people were complaining about the most as well, because it was the one major that freshmen could not, basically it was impacted, Linda. Freshmen could not get in and get classes in there. Mm-hmm. Admission officers will say at Pomona, and I could get into talking about admissions in a sec, that it's in it's a liberal arts school, so they're not really looking at major per much, you know, because you how, how they train you interdisciplinary. But they do don't want to have an imbalance. And they do get an inordinate number of computer science majors. So they just do. And you know, you would think, well, that I thought Harvey Mudd was there for that. Hey, comp sci is hot. So what are some other real popular majors at, at Pomona? Well, econ, math, and comp sci are the big three by far. Then there's a drop-off, but they have a lot of others. And they'll, those include IR, international relations, neuroscience, and neurobiology, communications, political science and government, liberal arts and humanities, biochem and molecular bio, history, public policy, and they also have quite a few visual arts majors. Uh, but they're just strong across the board. You definitely have your econ people that are trying to get the consulting jobs, and you have your comp side people, and you have math people, a lot of math majors that are doing biostats and things like that. Um, Pre-med is popular and strong. All the sciences are very strong, and so are the social sciences. I mean, they have the money and the location and the reputation um, that they can attract an incredibly strong faculty. And the faculty just get rave reviews for everybody, not just for their ability to teach, but how accessible they are and how friendly they are and and available. And that's one of the things I really think that makes Pomona stand out is world-class faculty, wicked smart kids, but balanced and humble, you know, from compared to, I would say, other, other peers of, of their type. And um, like I said, a lot more I'll say when I get into who I recommend. But um, I thought we could talk a little bit about their admission process. Yeah, absolutely. So they do CBE, Committee-Based Evaluation. That's two readers reading a file at the same time. And, you know, one of the things I'll say about Pomona is they, um, they really put a big emphasis on personal qualities in who they look for. So, you know, when you're looking at a school like this, they're all going to want a really strong transcript. I'm not telling anybody anything to say you know, they're going to be looking for lots of rigor and high grades in that rigor. And if there's testing in the file, the testing is going to have to be really strong. And the grade patterns are going to have to be positive. I'm not telling anybody anything when it comes to that. But they put, I would say, more emphasis than a lot of schools do on essays, recommendations, all recs, counselor, teacher, and other recs. But this is a place with a 6.6 admit rate that's only bringing in 415 students a year. So it's oftentimes those soft skills and those PQs, those personal qualities that they're looking for. Some of the PQs that I consistently heard 
admission officers articulate that they value at Pomona are intellectual curiosity, commitment to investing in the community, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and just diverse and unique kids, interesting kids with different experiences that are going to stand out. This is not a place where having a bunch of APs and high grades and sky high scores, it's just not going to cut it. There's Those kids are a dime a dozen in their applicant pool. So you need these other factors if you're going to stand out. And it's personal qualities that they look for a lot because there is a kind of intentional community that they want. Now, one of the admission officers was very clear, and this isn't new to anybody else, but it might be helpful for our listeners to hear it. They are completely signaling to you what they're looking for if you go read those um, those college-specific questions. They're letting you exactly know what they're looking for. And, you know, there's certain things they look for, like they they like kindness and they like friendliness. And they really are looking for people that are going to be able to get along with others. They're very, pro- very progressive so they value diversity of all types. They're 20% Pell. Um, they're incredibly racially diverse. If you look at their racial diversity numbers, there's as they've, you know, they've as diverse as any school you'll find in the country. Sure. And they put a big premium on premium on that. They do value leadership, but they don't define leadership the way that somebody might always think. Like the person who's doing an incredible mentoring job to their younger brother, that counts as leadership to them. And they're looking for those kinds of things. And so um, they, they, they want smart kids. And like Pitzer, there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of make a difference in the world and um, progressive ideology. It's not a place where you're going to find a lot of conservatives, but, um, they are also very, very focused on um, coming out of that place and making a good living, you know, as well. So in their admission process, demonstrated interest counts a decent amount, no question about it. ED1, ED2, you got to nail those those essays. They're looking for that fit. But those are just some of the things I would say is that kindness and that of friendliness and that ability, like they have a very intentional community. And they're not a place that's going to take kindly to hubris. They like to see some transparency. Uh, They like to, you know, this admission officer said, look, we're human and we identify with humanness. When we see someone that presents himself as perfection, we don't relate to that because we're not that. So they like to see some some vulnerability, you know, in the file. But any questions about anything, Linda? I just find that so refreshing. Uh, to to have a school just value those simple uh, traits that I, I value in my own personal life. Uh, so really refreshing. And can I just say, Mark, um, mm-hmm. you talking about Pomona as a liberal arts college? I went out and I looked at their um, the top industries for grads, and it reflects exactly what you said: consulting and tech are the top two industries for their grads, which I wouldn't necessarily think for for a liberal arts school. So they, they definitely have something to offer everyone. I was talking to someone really knowledgeable, and how did they get this crazy money? You know, like, that's a ridiculous amount of money for a school that's still not that old. And, you know, they've definitely had ties to the whole tech scene and, and to to, you know, all the venture capitalism and all the money that you see in California. Um, they've benefited from that tremendously. What may surprise you is that Pomona suffered through a really severe financial crisis during its early years. It was founded amidst a real estate boom in California. Then right in the midst of that real estate boom, the bubble popped and it was left scrambling. And they realized then, I believe how important fundraising was going to be. So President James Blaisdell, who I mentioned earlier, he was very successful in convincing several millionaires that the college had huge potential. And he launched the Million Dollar Fund Drive back in 1910 that was, it took off. But believe it or not, the president that gets most of the credit for the financial prowess of Pomona 
is Blaisdell's successor, Wilson Lyon, who was a Rhodes, Rhodes Scholar from Oxford, who was the president for almost 30 years, from 41 to 69. And he's regarded as having the strongest influence on the fundraising. Uh, some of the biggest financial success came in 1944 when he uh, launched what no, was known as the Pomona Plan. And what it did was it allowed people who wanted to give an endowed gift to receive some pretty generous benefits, financial management services, guaranteed annual income, and in many cases, names plastered all over buildings. So who is it good for? Smart kids? Smart kids? There is a lot of homework here. I don't want to make it sound like it's all Frisbee throwing out here on the quads, even if they have some good ones. Uh, Lots of homework, but somebody who can process things pretty fast. Otherwise, you're going to be, I mean, we heard from some some people that, hey, I go to bed at three and four. Um, Not everybody's that way, but you need to be able to process fast. Lots of homework, smart kids, very social kids. This is not a place where they want you in the dorm all the time. It would be uncomfortable if you want to just hang out in your dorm. Normally, that person wouldn't get through their admission process. They're going to try to pull you out of that. Um, kids who love to be in a community, it's got such a family feel. Kids who who love work-life balance, um, non-pretentious kids. Uh, I think they'll s- sense egotism in the admission file. That's not going to serve you well. Definitely liberal kids. Um, you know, those questions came up similar to Pitzer, our conservative voices in the classroom. And that was really not affirmed that there's not really a place where there's a lot of dialogue across ideological lenses happening that much in the classroom. So it's a very liberal community. Um, kids who appreciate nature, um, the trees, the beach, the desert, the mountains, kids who want to know their teachers well and value the access that they get. Kids who want um, a national and an international population. I would say self-confident but modest kids. Kids who love a beautiful self-contained campus. Kids who'll take advantage of the consortium. Kids who don't need big-time athletics. Yeah, they've got their rivalry. They've got their big rivalry with with, uh, Claremont McKenna and Mudd and Scripps. They mean, they got a big rivalry there, but... You know, don't don't be thinking you're getting USC because you're not, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind kids who appreciate kindness and friendliness. They've got really strong acapella groups, several of them. I mean, we had one perform for us that was just unbelievable. So that's just a little niche. If you're a singer, um, you want comp sci in a real small environment, um, very strong LGBTQ population that's quite large. And so if you're looking for a large LGBTQ population, by the way, that would also be true of Pitzer. Uh, one of the, the first faculty member we met at Pitzer was trans and Scripps as well, more so than at, at Claremont or Mudd. Um, I would say those three schools have the large LGBTQ population. Kids who are okay with people knowing your business, that was one of the complaints besides not being able to get CS, is it's the biggest of the Claremonts. But it still can be a fishbowl. Um, open-minded kids, uh, kids that want to change the world, but still are very ambitious with career aspirations. Um, even that they're very diverse in a lot of ways, I still say the same thing. You got to be comfortable with wealth because there's a lot of wealth here. So that that that's Pomona in a nutshell. Sounds pretty close to perfect for a, a school or a vacation spot, <laughs> according to me. You know. I have to say this, you know, and of course, I've been there four times since 2012, but, and there's a lot of places I haven't been to yet, but I was, when I was there at this time, I said, you know what? I should take our whole family and do an Airbnb here. I'm serious. Just because of the backdrop of those San Gabriel mountains is just so gorgeous. The trees everywhere. And I, and, you know, I haven't talked about this this much. Karis and I, we fell in love with that little village, which is two blocks away. I love the Claremont, Claremont Village. So it, it it is it is one of those places that you would be shocked to hear about a crime. A crime. You know, crime occurs everywhere, but it does have a little bit of that. Uh, this is as good as it gets vibe, especially if you like sunny California like I do. I'm a sun person. You know that. 
Well, I, I love it there. And those San Gabriel Mountains were the first mountains I ever saw. Uh, the first time I went to Los Angeles, flew in at night and woke up and, whoa, there are mountains right there, you know, coming from the Midwest. We don't have mountains that big. And uh, so Mount Baldy was the first mountain I ever made it to the top of. Okay, it may be the only mountain <laughs> I've ever been to the top of. Uh, you came yeah, clean. It is, you came it clean. is beautiful. It is beautiful there. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks. Next up, Redlands. All right. See you next time. See ya. Friends, on Monday's episode, of course, we'll talk about the hot issues in the world of higher ed. We'll continue something we started last week, which is take a speak pipe question so we can stay ahead of you. And We'll also have the final part of Linda and me interviewing Mitch Warren, the Director of Admission, as well as the Associate Vice President, Vice Provost of Enrollment of Purdue. And it is the big three zero zero, a huge landmark that I'm really excited about. Hope to see you Monday. And friends, it's it's Black History Month, so I'm going to be sharing some first-time quotes that I really like that have stood out to me. And there's no better place to go for quotes than Martin Luther King. So. Here's one that's not as famous as some of his others that I really like. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. You only need a soul generated by love to serve. From the great Martin Luther King. See you Monday, everybody. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Dalianos Dimitru. If you want to have a coaching session with Lisa or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.